All right, I think we can get started. Uh, we are here for the demystifying of workload identity tutorial um, with Spire, of course, on cloud native ecosystem. Uh, before I start the tutorial, I just want to see a uh, show of hands if you don't have a laptop to work on for this tutorial. Okay, we have a couple of folks. Uh, for the rest of the folks, so this is going to be a hands-on tutorial. I'm just going to talk you know, briefly for 10 minutes and give you an overview of what we are going to do. And uh, the rest of you can follow the tutorial. We'll give you actual environments to work on. And the folks that don't have an environment, uh, one of us is going to do this live. There is so. no requirement for tooling. As long as you have a browser, you're good. Yeah. And you need to know copy and paste. Uh, method, which is pretty simple here. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> All right, uh, so let's get started. Let's talk about Spiffy and Spire and workload identity. Um, before I start the session, I would like to introduce myself and my co-presenters today. I am Anjali Telang. I am the product manager for OpenShift uh, authentication, and I have with me some excellent rock stars who have worked on this tutorial. Uh, do you want to come uh, introduce yourselves? Does that work? Oh, you want to do it? It does. Hey, everyone. My name is Andy Block. I'm a distinguished architect in Red Hat's Global Services Office of Technology. Uh, I work with our customers to implement cloud solutions and securing their organization. I'm also a Helm maintainer and a SIG store uh, contributor, so working a lot in both the CNCF and security space. And my name is Maya. I am a research software developer at IBM. And related to this technology, we do a lot of work with Spire and the Spire community. Uh, I am a maintainer of the Torniak project, which is a project within the Spiffy Spire community for specifically simplifying the visibility and manageability of Spire. Hello, my name is Marius Sabat. I'm from IBM Research, uh, senior engineer on multi-cloud identity, and I'm one of the maintainers on the Helm Charts Spire uh, project with the Torniak Focus and Zero Trust. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thank you guys. And they've done all the hard work, so <laughs> when you do applaud, please applaud for them. <laughs> all right, uh, so, Here's the plan. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what we want to cover in the tutorial today. Um, I, it, I promise I will get through it quickly so that you can get to the good stuff and get into the actual tutorial and start digging in. Uh, but it's important to talk about you know, why we're here and uh, you know, what problem we want to solve. Uh, so as I get started, um, show of hands of how many of you have heard of Spiffy and Spire, and I, I know one gentleman there. <laughs> I see your shirt. <laughs> awesome. Many of you have heard. All right, so we have a mixed audience, and that's great because now we can really dig into the problem and so solve some of the workload identity uh, issues. So state of workload identity. First of all, why do we need identity? Um, we need identity in a zero trust model because Zero trust says uh, never trust, always verify. So we want to verify everything and everyone, uh, whether it's a machine or whether it's a human. Uh, in traditional uh, perimeter models, what you will see is this was addressed by um, you know, IP, uh, mostly IP. You know, each of the machines would get IP um, and some sort of uh, technologies on top of it. And that's great. You know, we need those. We need those for fast communication, secure communication. But it doesn't really represent the workload itself. So uh, there needs to be way, a way for uh, the workloads to be represented, a workload to say, hey, here's who I am, and uh, for someone to verify the who I am. So uh, that's what workload identity is all about. And uh, in Kubernetes, let's look at some of the challenges that we have today. So Kubernetes comes with service accounts uh, for handling uh, 
uh, the you know for the for the workload identity uh, solution for any of the service to talk to any other service and service accounts have uh, tokens and credentials and these can be short lived or long lived so long lived credentials long lived tokens like uh, you know in any other scenario whenever you are using long lived credentials there's always um, issues uh, they can be easily exfiltrated, um, they can be misused, exploited. Uh, it's hard to control the blast radius. Uh, it, uh, you know, uh, it sort of violates the zero trust prin principle because uh, now you're putting all the trust on the administrator and uh, there can be issues with your compliance as well. So this is you know, always a problem, having long-lived credentials. It's easy to use, but it is not very secure. Then there's bound service account tokens. Uh, those are great. They, have, they are short-lived. They are audience-bound. But uh, they are specific to a cluster. So you know, in a multi-cluster scenario, you have to come up with a lot of automation and work around it. And that's where the, you know, the cloud uh, federation comes in. So a lot of the uh, cloud platforms today have a federation model where you can integrate uh, with their IAM uh, services and get short-lived OIDC tokens. Uh, those are great. Those can be rotated. Uh, those are audience-bound. But there are some challenges with that. And those challenges are that each of these clouds has their own sort of uh, schema around how they handle identity. And um, uh, that's for one cloud. You work with that. Now you have to work with another cloud. So again, you have to work through their uh, schema and their trust model. So imagine you're working with all of these clouds together because you have applications everywhere uh, on-prem and in the cloud. What happens then? Um, you know, uh, As my friend Marish has put it very eloquently here, it just adds to the quadratic complexity. Uh, I promise it's not my word, it's his. <laughs> it comes from research. So, uh, and the complexity is around, you know, how do you configure this? How do you automate this? How do you do it securely? How many resources you want to put in it? So that's the complexity, that's how it gets added. Okay, this just basically recaps the problem uh, where, where I mentioned that you have to make sure that your identity provider, your trust is properly configured, uh, your applications are able to gain the workload identity, uh, uh, you have to enforce the right policies at the policy enforcement point, and uh, there's the right automation to handle all this. Now, single cloud is hard. But multi-cloud is even harder. So the quadratic complexity I was talking about, just imagine all the other clouds in this picture, and it just becomes uh, very difficult to manage, very resource uh, intensive, uh, not, just, you know, not just machine resources, but human resources that you need to put into this effort. OK, we talked a lot about the problem. Let's talk about the solution. And solution is straightforward, is the introduction of Spiffy and Spire to solve this problem. So what is it? These are all CNCF projects. Uh, Spiffy is a graduated project. And Spiffy is the standard for uh, providing the common identity format, uh, the essence of which is short-lived verifiable identities, uh, SVIDs, uh, where the spiffy identity is encoded inside an X509 or a JOT. Spire, um, we're going to get through a little bit more detail in few, like, later slides. Spire is an implementation of spiffy, and um, this provides the actual organization-wide workload identity. Um, it, it handles and manages these identities, rotation, uh, revocation, et cetera. And it also provides a single point of federation uh, with OIDC discovery. And then finally, there's Torniak. Torniak is uh, the control plane that uh, my friend Maya uh, mentioned earlier. 
Uh, it provides you with a nice visibility um, uh, around uh, Spiffy and the identities across your organization. And together with Kubernetes, it provides a universal workload identity solution. All right, so that picture now is a little bit better. You still have to put in work. <laughs> but now you have this nice, comprehensive uh, platform uh, that you can have for managing trust across all your organization needs. A bit into the architecture, I'm just going to give you a very high-level overview. Uh, there are lots of folks uh, that can you know, uh, give you more details here. And in the tutorial, we have excellent uh, links and descriptions. You can go over that. But at a very high level, um, the Spire architecture has two main elements, the Spire server and the Spire agent. Now, Spire server, think of it as uh, your control plane for Spire. Um, and Spire agents are your data plane, which is like every uh, node will have a Spire agent. So what does the Spire server do? The Spire server is the one that provides the Spiffy IDs, the, uh, uh, the identities uh, in X509 or JWT format. It uh, integrates nicely with upstream CAs. Uh, it does node attestation. Now, this is the, you know, this is the key thing that, I want you guys to really take away from this presentation and from the tutorial that Spire provides both uh, uh, spewing of short-lived tokens and also doing that in a, a testable way. So the, the attestation happens at both node level and workload level. At the node level, um, uh, node level attestation is when uh, the Spire agent is deployed on the node for the first time it gets, um, the Spire agent will first authenticate to the Spire server. And the way it authenticates is it queries the infrastructure on which it is deployed, uh, sends that information out to the Spire server. And the Spire server will itself validate that information using external APIs. So that's how node attestation works. It's available for AWS, GCP, Azure. Um, uh, Kubernetes uses service accounts for this because service account tokens can be reviewed with token review API. And uh, that's where, what Spire server does. Uh, it integrates with Torniac, like we've talked about uh, user management, visibility, policy, et cetera. Uh, it also provides the OIDC federation. And um, the last but not the least uh, important bullet, uh, the Spire controller manager is one of the, um, uh, the way, ways in which it in integrates with Kubernetes. Spire's controller manager is a Kubernetes uh, uh, controller manager. Basically, it provides uh, registration for all the workloads that are uh, present in the cluster. So that's the Spire server. Now, the Spire agent, like I mentioned, is deployed on all of the nodes in the cluster. Um, it participates in the node level attestation. Now it does the workload level attestation. And what that means is that workloads will talk to the um, uh, agent using the workload API. And uh, the workload API will make sure that it validates the workload. Um, and the attestation happens using attester plugins. So there's a plugin for Kubernetes attestation, and that plugin uses pod ID, so it will query the kernel, get the C group pod ID from that, present it to the kubelet, and get information about the application. Then it will uh, compare that to the information it fetches from the Spire server, and if there is a match, then it will provide the workload identity to the application. The way it work provides the workload identity is using a volume mount with CSI driver. Um, host path is also available, but we suggest you use the CSI driver. So uh, I'm going to pause here, but uh, anything to add, Maya or Maria short? Maybe it's like, who, if, if anyone has questions, that might be useful. Or yeah, I think we'll take, oh, oh, you have a question, sorry. 
explore this stuff. It'll, it'll yeah, make so, more. so help me out. Um, and full disclosure, I'm a little bit dangerous at this, but um, the workload attestation bit and the fire as a, as a federation, um, single federation point, that makes sense. There's a certain level of complexity, if not cognitive why, why would one do that versus, say, just taking a um, service account token and inject it into a pod and doing token exchange? You can do it for one cluster, but uh, now, like, like I mentioned, each of these identity providers have their own uh, federation, right? So it depends on which cloud you're working on, then you have to work on that, and then add automation for another cloud and another cloud. So that's the complexity we were talking about. Uh, there is no I common do, trust domain. I could do it for any number of Kubernetes clusters, provided that I, I whitelist them to the right to the failure of point in advance and establish a trust relationship with the cluster. I could do that. Sure. And I wouldn't need the extra part. The application would just have to know how to do it. But that's a lot of custom you know, tooling around this when there is already an architecture available that defines this. And the attestation bit, I know it sounds complex, but in the long run, it's really useful to know. And, and with the attestation, there are a lot of, uh, one thing I forgot to mention, Spire server is very extensible. There are lots of plugins available. And the, the more plugins you add, the richer it gets. So there's a lot of plugins around uh, hardware security modules, et cetera, that you can integrate with the attestation and, and uh, make it really, uh, especially for mission critical workloads, you can really uh, you know, make it more secure. Uh, yeah, Mariusz? Yeah, the yeah. plugins are customizable. You can select your own depends on the situation. But what I suggest, we should go to the workshop and go and show you everything we plan to discuss today. Then I think that sounds good. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, what we can do is, uh, We're going to have some time at the end anyway. Yes, we are going to have some time. The workshop is probably going to take 40, 45 minutes. So let's get through like a couple of more slides. And then I promise I won't keep you long. Uh, we will talk about what we are going to cover in the workshop. And then uh, you go through the workshop. Some of the questions might get answered while you're doing it. and. In the end, I really want to keep about half an hour or 20, 25 minutes no. just to talk. Do we have that much time? No. You okay. Guys okay. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, now that the architecture is out of the way and we know it's the secure solution, let's look at how um, two, uh, two real world uh, users, Bob and Kaya, would approach this. Now, Bob and Kaya were first not aware of Spiffy and Spire. Um, so Bob, being a sort of happy-go-lucky but lazy developer, uh, he decided to uh, hard code credentials for one of the applications he was writing. He was in a hurry. He said, OK, let's, uh, it, and, and the credentials were required to access a backend database. So hard codes it and pushes it, and he's ready to go. He's ready to go have coffee with his friends. But Kaya, who's the administrator, thinks it's a little bit curious that this is working out all great, but is it going to be an insecure uh, solution? So she does some of the work herself and tries to redeploy the application and test it out. Meanwhile, uh, as I mentioned, long live credentials. Anyone can get those credentials and attack that golden database and get your valuable information. So. Bob and Kaya, they attended the tutorial, went through it, loved what they saw. And so after their learnings, uh, this is what happened. So Kaya decided she wants to have Spire in her environment. So she installed the Spire server and agent. And then she made sure that OIDC discovery is enabled. And she configured it. Next, she configured Vault. Um, 
and she made sure that she's uh, configuring the Spire server as the OIDC authentication provider for the vault. And after she's done that, she says, Bob, go ahead and now use the secure deployment. So then Bob, oh, here you go. So Bob has become uh, Spire savvy as well. And so uh, what Bob does is, oh, did it not? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so Bob uh, goes and stores the database credentials inside Vault. And then he says, okay, now that I have those in Vault and secured, let's redeploy the application with a sidecar. And the sidecar is going to fetch the uh, .svid from the Spire agent. Um, once all that attestation logic has happened, uh, I, uh, now the sidecar has the SVID, and this is presented to Vault, and this is, this is when Vault will authenticate and then give the credentials to the sidecar, and this is then loaded in the applications um, using volume mount. So now this is a secure uh, application deployment model using Spire, and this is what you're going to do in the tutorial also. This is exactly the workflow you're going to use. All right, uh, quick recap uh, on all the, the, uh, you know, the, the good things about using Spire. So we have now dynamically uh, provided credential instead of hard coding them. Uh, they are restricted by audience. Uh, the credentials are short-lived and often rotated. Um, and then Spire does that not just for uh, one workload, but for all the workloads uh, that are there on the cluster. And, um, and, and node level attestation also happens, and workload level attestation also happens. So now everyone can go drink their coffee. All right. So thanks for, you know, uh, for your patience going through this. I know you're excited for the next phase. And uh, what I would like is uh, for you to give your feedback to us uh, on you know, what are the use cases you want to solve and uh, uh, what are the different options you're considering, and even like feedback on the uh, uh, tutorial itself. You, please, please definitely contact us. OK? okay. All right. Here's the tutorial link if you want to use that. And uh, the first link itself is uh, for the tutorial. And the second link is where you can uh, log in to the demo clusters that we've stood up for you. OK, how many people were able to access the tutorial and the, wor the work club, workshop environment? OK, few people. Right. So if you follow the second link, you would end up with a page that looks like this. So put your user ID, that's the, and the email, it doesn't matter, and then the password, which is uh, what I just said earlier. And if you do this, assuming you don't have the same emails, you would end up with a page that looks like this. So we'll copy the password here. Click on the link and log in with the cube admin and the password that is just for you. There's about 100 machines right now provisioned there, so I think we should be okay. And eventually, you would end up with a page that looks like this. Okay, so let's, I will have the tutorial here on the right. Make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so there's a lot of good text. You can read it. I would just go to the good parts. So set up the environment. So we have access to environment. Set 
So how many people are on this stage that you can see what I see here on the screen? Okay, we have few. Very good. Okay, so if you follow this little red arrow on the top, it's going to get you to a console. Okay, once you open the console, it says, Welcome to OpenShift Web Terminal. And this is basically what we're going to be using for the rest of the day here. Yeah. I'll make it bigger. Okay, we need to export few environment variables. So I will just grab one from here. individual app domain, which is specific for your cluster, so everyone would get a different. Let's make sure that we have the domain set. So this one looks, mine looks like this. You have probably something similar. This is basically the public access from outside to your cluster. It's an ingress. All right, I'll go to the next step. Okay, deploying application. So now I'll be performing the role of Bob and I will deploy the application. So I will go and get the clone of the repository that we use for this demo. And you have all these instructions here, so you can read it in your leisure. This is actually good stuff to do before falling to bed, falling to sleep. Uh, so we deploy the namespace, my SQL database, and the Python uh, application that is would be accessing this database and pulls the data out of the uh, out of the database and displays on the screen. So step one, once we have a code locally here, let me just run, create the namespace for application. Because as a, uh, as a security experts, we don't want to use the default one. You should never use the default. Let's, go the, let's create our own one. Here you go. All right, so now I'm going to dip uh, deploy the MySQL database. Let's see if that was deployed. Okay, creating. If you're lazy, don't want to do it multiple times, we just put wait. All right, it's running. Okay, so once the application is running, let's get access to this database. So I'm copying this command right here. Oops. Oh yeah, I just started the database. I didn't start the application yet. Okay, so. Application is right here, sorry. So database is operational. Now the application. Same thing, let's verify the application is up. Creating.
Okay, the app is running as well. So we have both database and the application are operational. So now I should be able to get access to the application, which is this command here. Good. So this is a link that I can open now in a browser. And very simple app. It's just pulling some data from the database, you know, little movies. In fact, if you want to get fancy, you can actually add a new movie or delete the movies, but I don't think we need to do it right now. All right. So this part is done. Let's go to the next step. Next step is identifying security challenges. Okay. So this whole page here describes basically what Anjali was telling us on the presentation. What are the challenges with the application? Why the using hard-coded keys is not a bad idea, is not a good idea. And you know, so for example, we have this access to the database in form of a configuration file. That's this guy. And that has been hard coded as a config map in, in an application. So there's a whole discussion why this is not good and what we can do better. I will just skip it for now and go to the next deploying spire. This doesn't mean you don't have to read it. You have to read it, but you know, you don't have to do it right now. Okay, deploying Spire using Helm. All right, so we have this nice Helm charts that allow you to install Spire quickly. So let's get the Helm charts now. Okay, the repo is preloaded on my, to my machine. So the first step, we're going to deploy CRDs. They should be deployed separately as a best practice for Helm charts. So we'll set up a few CRDs. All right. And now we'll deploy the actual Spire environment, which deploys Spire server, Spire agent, and all the good stuff. So this command right here, it's already uh, pre-populated with all the values. I uh, will show you also Torniak. Torniak is the user interface to Spire. Uh, we are, Maya and myself, we are part of the team that works on this. Uh, we need contribution, so if you, if you like it, you're welcome to join us. All right. So let's do this. This might take a minute to deploy because it's doing several operations, setting up all the services. Actually, I can open another terminal and just show you the progress. Oh, I think it's already finished. All right, very good. So there's some post install things that validate stuff that is correctly deployed. Yeah, it's all set. Okay. So Spire has been installed. Let's verify. Yep. Spire installed. We can even demonstrate you that this is a there's a daemon set running. 
we have the agents, expire agents. So since there is only one node in this cluster, that means there's only one spire agent. Spire agents are deployed as a daemon set. So uh, for each individual node, they get this uh, spire agent. There's only one here. All right. So let's validate that we have OIDC discovery service operational because this is going to be a key for the next few steps. So let me make sure we have this part operational. Yep, looks like we have the public key available for the discovery, which is great. All right, so Torniak. Let's see if I can get access to our famous Torniak. By the way, Torniak, that's the name of the dog breed somewhere from Europe. It's a herding, it's a herding? Shepherd. Shepherd, yeah. So it's like containers, little cows, all little yeah, animals. So shepherding, okay. Okay, so this command here provides the URL for Torniak. Let me see if I can access it. All right, so here's the little Torniak and you have a cluster. You can define multiple information about clusters. So uh, agents, this is the list of all the agents. There's only one because there's only one node, but if you have 30, this actually comes help, helpful and useful. Entries shows all the active entries. So we have a few entries. Yeah, this is really nice for inspecting your like, tested, your, your spooky IDs, um, and debugging your like, entry So by the way, I'm going a little bit on attention here, but we are working now on extending Torniak with a functionality for Spire Federation. So you can bring multiple Spires together and they would be trusting each other. You can actually use this UI for connecting uh, and assigning which workload identities would get uh, federated and so on. So this is basically on our plate for the next few weeks, months, I think. Yeah, let's do it next year, exactly. Or maybe for Kubeco, if we, if we get this done. All right, so this is Torniak. Let's go to the next, deploying vault. Okay, so again, just to follow up what Angeli said earlier, keeping credentials in the cluster, not a great idea, not keeping them hard-coded. We should put them to some other tool so they can be decoupled from the application. Now you can rotate them easily and pull dynamically to the application as needed. So let's do this. First, we'll create a separate namespace for Vault. Okay, now I'm going to deploy Vault. Okay, Vault is being deployed. So let's just validate if I can see it. Oh, it's still creating. So, oh, it's running, all right. Okay, so we're going to get access to Vault. So there's this command that basically converts uh, the public ingress to something useful. And let's see if we can access it. Okay, so it's in a healthy state. I can access Vault, I can get the information back of it. So good. Now, we cannot just use Vault as uh, directly for uh, for this presentation, 
we want to configure it in a way that it accepts Spire as one of the identity uh, identities. So in order to do this, I need to obtain a root login. So I am now the administrator who sets up the vault before the application can actually use it. So let me just get my password for this vault. Okay, so I have this root token. Again, this is just for setting up. This is just as an administrator. I do it once. Let's validate if I can access with this password. Okay, it works. Otherwise, I would get an error. So now we have this handy script. Okay, but before I do it, let me set up the environment. So tutorial root, and I'm going to execute the script. Okay, so this script basically sets up all the policies. It sets up the, uh, the plugin that allows the vault to understand what spiffy ID identities are, and sets up the authentication. So let's go through these few steps just so I can show you what we did. So show policy. So I set up the policy. It's important to note that the policy basically, we're going to be using a key value um, secret store. It's basically allowing read access on what we're going to be creating. So we're just going ahead and pre-setting up the configuration so that down the road when our application needs to access the vault, it's going to have the right to just access that specific key value store. Yep. Okay, so now you can, you can see that uh, there's JWT uh, functionality enabled in addition to the token that we used initially. Oh, let me show you the DB role. Okay, so this is actually key here, this part. So we set up the policy that it can accept only identities that come from this domain, trust domain, which is basically the domain that we are using here for this example. And the namespace has to be workload identity tutorial, and the service account has to be PY. That's the name of the application that we use. So once I have this defined, so this is the uh, role and policies that we defined, now we can store some real values in Vault. So we're going to convert the da database configuration file that I showed you before. Uh, we'll, this is this format here. Okay, let me just show you. Okay, and since format of this uh, of this file is not JSON, what we're going to do? We're going to play a trick and encode this file into a string, and then keep the string as an encoded string in a database. If we had this in a JSON format, I don't have to worry about this. You could be easily uploaded to Vault. So. Let me put this, okay, I need to convert. I didn't do this part yet. So I'm going to take the in, init, database init file, convert to base64 string, and store it as a value in the, in the vault. Okay. It's there, so now let me see if I can read it. So let me just show you how it would look like without decoding it. So it's basically just a long string. Actually, 
Oops, I think it's easier if I just... Okay, yeah, so once we decode it, it's back to the values that we preserved earlier in the file. Okay, so now we have this whole chapter about spy workload identities. Andy put a lot of effort to writing all this, so thank you, Andy. And so what, what we're going to do now, I will show you, we'll create a little debug pod that can actually go and uh, we can go inside of this container and I'll show you all the steps that we are doing in order to obtain the identity from uh, the, the identity for the database from Vault. Okay, so the application called Spire Debug has been created. And by the way, it's using the CSI driver uh, to talk to Spire agent and obtain identities for this pod. So let's see if it's operational. Okay, it's running. So now I can get inside. So I'm getting inside of this container. All right, and now we can do a few things here. So first one, let's just fetch identity for this container. So for those who know what, who've done before Spire, this is pretty straightforward. You, I'm sure you've done this before. It's basically, uh, using the Spire agent binary file, we just call to fetch API, uh, to, to fetch JWT token, and with the, using audience called Vault on the socket path, which is basically access to CSI. Okay, so this part right here is this JWT token with the encoded identity information. So I'm going to take this guy. How many people have played around with JWT tokens before? Raise your hand. Do you even know what JWT just, just did? Okay, so let's go to this JWT debugger and I can show you the identity that we just received for this container. So basically it has this level information. So here, this is, this is the identity for this container. Uh, right here. Okay. It's using the trust domain, namespace, and the service account. Okay. And that matches the policy that we defined on Vault. So if we send this request to Vault, in theory, should retur return the values for us. So we did this part. So let me store this token as an environment variable. Okay, so now I have this stored. I can show you how it looks like. Okay, so that's basically the same as above. Well, okay, maybe not be. Maybe it's not the same because the time changed. So there's a small value change. But all right. So this is all chapter about what's inside of the token, and I just showed you. So here now we're going. We're going to use this token obtained from Spire to get access to Vault. So that's this comment right here. Okay. See right here the client token? This is the temporary token that we receive 
to access Vault. So we're going to parse this token and request the actual secret. All right, here you go. So we were able to get the secret out. Once it was delivered, then we convert it back to, uh, we, we decoded from the base 64. So now it's converted back, back to text, which we can store locally and used by the application to uh, access the database. So since I am inside of the container, I'm going to exit back to our development, to our environment. And I don't think we need this guy anymore, so I'm going to delete it. That was just for demonstration purpose. All right, so we have, we have deployed Spire, we have deployed Vault, we injected the credentials into Vault, we tested that they can be obtained from inside of the sidecar. So now let's do this inside of the actual application. So first step, I'm going to delete the config map, which contains the hard-coded database information for our application. Okay. Now, Let's redeploy the app. This time it contains the little sidecar that does automatically what we went through in a minute, from a few minutes ago. So as you can see, a few things changed, like the application itself. It's different. Let's make sure it's deployed. Oh, it's still terminating the old one. Okay, I'll put this on white. Okay, so the way this is structured, this sidecar is defined as a init container. So it does this work ahead of time, obtains the identity from the database, for, for the database, and then injects this to a shared a drive that can be uh, read from inside of the application. This is just for this demo for today. Typically what happens, the sidecar can be assisting the application continuously. If any time data changes, if any of the uh, tokens are being recycled or uh, recreated, it would pick up the changes and put it back into a file. Then any time application sees the changes, it would restart uh, the application with the new credentials. So since this is running, now let me get back again, the public access to, so this is the new application, the running with the sidecar, config map was deleted, so everything we have now is dynamically obtained from the vault. So let's go back to the application. Yeah, it's working again. Right. Actually, maybe I should have added something on the old database, like some random text, and then I could show it now that it's still using the same database with the dynamic keys. We should have done it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but this will be more convincing. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, there'll be, no, there's zero trust. Don't trust me. You know, maybe it was fully recorded. You don't know, I'm just good in clicking. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe that was fully recorded. Make sure it's on the database. It's on the database. Exactly. Okay, so conclusions. So this is what you learned <laughs> today. There is a set of useful, useful links. We uh, encourage everyone to go through some of these links. And if you're interested in getting more information about this project, about some of the work that we're doing, either reach out to us directly or through these links or Slack channels. So we are publicly available. Yeah, there is, you actually have to remove one of the values that says enable OpenShift, okay? So there is one value that says OpenShift yes or no, you just set to no, that's it, I think. And if you have any specific ingress requirements, you have to modify the ingress value, but otherwise it would be identical. So you can run this on kind or on any cloud that you have access to. Uh, what else? For Torniak, I'm pitching Torniak again. But for Torniak, we are also we also introduce the user management, which you know the Torniak that I showed you today, it has no access. Like everybody who knows the URL can they can access, but there is also user management that could be integrated with IAM, either through uh, Keyclock or directly using OIDC authentication like with different uh, IAMs, uh, AWS works as well. So we have this production level access control. Uh, let's see what else we should say. Questions. Questions, yes, questions. I've been talking, I've been talking a lot, so, uh, so maybe questions now to Anjali, Andy, Maya, because they feel like they, they under uh, appreciate it. I'm really happy to hear it. Yes. We try, I, I, we try to make it so that like my mother can go through it. So if you ever do any workshops or any tutorial educational materials, always kind of put someone who probably isn't as the most tech person as your guinea pig. They can go through yeah. it, or at least understand it, succeed it. As, as you could see, there is no magic here. It's just copy paste comments. And these are very simple comments. There is no open shift. If we didn't tell you this is running on OpenShift, you wouldn't even know. There's no OpenShift specific operations. There was no OpenShift client anywhere. Just we, a simple. We, we have the terminal. The terminal we have well, yeah, that, that's the only reason why we use it because yeah. OpenShift allow us to to prepare the environments for you, so everybody would be running the same exactly demo. It would be a nightmare to run it on your local machine today with 100 people having all questions about, yeah, how do you set up environment on my Windows machine? I don't know. So yeah, this was, this was the easy way. That was the only reason why we ran OpenShift. Yes, sir. Oh yeah, so what we could have done here for this presentation, which would be probably a little bit more difficult for, to, to do it in, in, in one workshop, but we could convert the MySQL to completely ignore secrets and just adapt to uh, Spire and Spiffy identities. 
that would be very easy for us to do as well. But we would lose the ability to show you all these growing pains of going from one process to another one. So that we, we decided to do this way. I agree that if we remove secrets completely, just use the short-lived identities to communicate between the application and the database or any service, that would be real zero trust. But you know, we would lose the story that we are trying to, to sell here. Right, right. But not every application supports spiffy and spy identity. And sometimes the only solution is to do something like this. You basically decouple the credentials from the application, put it in some other place. I'm not saying it has to be Vault. It could be something else, right? But you put it in a place that can be retrieved using identity. So you're introducing some parts of the zero trust. I know it's not perfect, but it's better than just having them hard coded. Yes, sir. You're very welcome. That's not fair. You have a T-shirt, so we know that you, this is. <laughs> Could be fun. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. When it comes to federation, uh, it works well with um, a few clusters, but when, it, when you have multiple clusters federating to each other, you have this explosion of many, many relationships, federation, right. federation relationships between them. And uh, you could opt in for like a nested uh, spire architecture, but I think, you know, the devil's in the details. Correct. It's um, definitely, I think the, another pain point is uh, registration. And registration, uh, I think, uh, Evan, if someone says, like, whoever actually deployed Spire in production uh, has wrote their own uh, <laughs> registrar at some point. Uh, so with Kubernetes, it's fairly, uh, uh, it's fairly with the, the control manager. Sure, yeah. But the identities that you get are uh, rigid unless you write your own uh, CID or something. Or something. Yeah, you can modify the format of it, of course. Yes, you don't have to use the standard. We just use, we just opt for the defaults, which is the namespace and the service accounts. You can actually go very fancy. You can. We did experiments in the past when we used the uh, image ID, actually even image SHA. So we have we 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 validated only specific image that was blessed and validated and trusted can access my database. I don't want anyone else to touch it. Even with the same image name, has to be the same version of the image, right? Because due due to some uh, government requirements, there has there, there is some policy that you know only the specific image can be executed right because it was validated and tested well tested by by some tooling some process Yeah. And I agree with your observation on federation, because Maya is our federation expert, and she spent long time to actually find out all the information available on how to basically start more 
simple federation and then more complex ones. So Maya is in the middle of preparing a blog that basically summarizes all her findings. I think that could be pretty useful. But there were a few challenges. She, she was not able to initially find enough information to do it properly, like you just said. You know, once you start scaling above certain levels, it becomes shaky. 